Hi, boys and girls. Today I'm going to read with you chapter four and share my thinking as I read. So um, just uh, follow along right with the screen um, and we're going to read together. So total darkness blotted out the sea and it became cold and damp. Timothy took the shelter down and we both pulled our shirts and pants back on. They were stiff from salt and felt clammy. The wind picked up, blowing the fine, chill spray across the wind, across the raft. Then the stars came out. We stayed in the middle of the raft, side by side, as it drifted aimlessly over the sea. Stu Cat rubbed his back against the bottoms of my feet, and then curled up down there. I was glad because he was warm. I was thinking that it was very strange for me a boy from Virginia to be lying beside this giant Negro out on the ocean. And I guess maybe Timothy was thinking the same thing. Once our bodies touched, we both drew back, but I drew back faster. In Virginia, I knew they'd always lived in their sections of town and, and us and ours, a few times, I'd gone down through the shacks of Color Town with my father. They sold spicy crabs in one shack, I remember. I saw them mostly in the summer, down by the river fishing and swimming naked, but I didn't really know any of them. And in Williamstead, I didn't know them very well either. Henrik Van Boven did though, and he was much easier with them. So right here, boys and girls in the text, where um, we see that like Henry, Vi Henry Van Boven had a different experience, we know that where, um, Philip came from. Um, he just didn't, he didn't live in a very um, diverse community. So it wasn't a time where they were necessarily forced to be separated between whites and blacks, but it was a time period where um, sometimes you just weren't together because that's just how your town or your community was at the time. So uh, Philip didn't have a lot of experience to go with. So he was in a very awkward situation. I asked Timothy, Where's your home? St. Thomas, he said. Charlotte Emil. Aunt St. Thomas, he added. Tis a virgin island. Then you are American, I said. I remembered from school that we had bought the virgins from Denmark. He laughed. I suppose, young boss, I never gave it much thought. I sail all the islands, as well as Venezuela, Colombo, Panama. I just never gave it much thought. I was American. I said, your parents were African, Timothy? He laughed low and soft. Young boss, you want me to say I true come from Africa? You say what you want. It was just that Timothy looked very much like the men I'd seen in jungle pictures, flat nose and heavy lips. He shook his head. I have no recollection of anything except these islands. Tis pure outrageous, but... I do not remember anything about a place called Africa. I don't know if he was telling the truth or not. He looked pure African, I said. What about your mother? Now, there was a deep laughter in his voice. It is more outrageous. I do not remember a father or my mother. I was raised by a woman called Hannah Gums. Then you are an orphan, I said. I guess, young boss, I guess. He was chuckling to himself, rich and deep. I looked over toward him, but again, he was just a shadowy shape, a large mound. How old are you, Timothy? I asked. That fact is also very mysterious. Little more than 60, cause the muscle in my leg be speaking to me, complaining all the time. But to be true, I do not know exact. I was amazed that any man shouldn't know his own age I was almost certain now that Timothy had indeed come from Africa, but I didn't tell him that. I said, I'm almost 12. I wanted him to know I was almost 12 so that he could stop treating me as though I were half that age. That is a very important age, Timothy agreed. Now you must get some natural sleep. Tomorrow will be a very long day, and we have much to do. I laughed. There we were on 
a bucking raft. Nothing to do except watch for schooners or aircraft. What do we have to do, I asked. His eyes groped through the darkness for mine. He came up on his elbows. Stay alive, young boss. That's what we have to do. Soon, it became very cold, and I began shivering. Part of it was coldness, but there was also fear. If the rap tipped over, sharks could spl- slash at us, I knew. My head was aching violently again. During the day, the pain had been dull, but now it was shooting along both sides of my head. Once, sometime during that early night, I felt his horny hand on my forehead. Then he lifted my body, placing it on the other side of him. He murmured, Young boss, the wind has shift. You'll be warmer on this side. I was still shivering, and soon he gathered me against him, and Stukat came back to be a warm ball against my feet. I could now smell Timothy tucked up against him. He didn't smell like my father or my mother. Father always smelled of bay rum, the shaving lotion he used, and mother smelled of some kind of perfume or cologne. Timothy smelled different and strong, like the black men who worked on the decks of the tankers when... So it's interesting here while I'm waiting for the page to go up uh, that... um, Timothy is being so kind to Philip, and even though it's a little uncomfortable, they seem to be um, getting along quite well, that they were loading. After a while, I didn't mind the smell because Timothy was back, back was very warm. The raft plunged on across the light swells through the long night. I do not think he slept much during the night, but I'd been told that old people didn't sleep much anyway. I woke up when there was a pale band of light to the east, and Timothy said, you fare well, young boss. How is de ed? It still hurts, I admitted. Timothy said, a crack on de head takes a few days to go away. He opened the trap of the raft to pull out the water keg and the tin containing the biscuits and chocolate squares and dry matches. I sat up feeling dizzy. He allowed me half a cup of water and two hard biscuits, then fed stew cat with a wedge of leftover flying fish. Wait in silence as the light crept steadily over the smooth, oily sea. The wind had died, and already the sun was beginning to scorch. Timothy chewed slowly on half a biscuit. Today, young boss, a schooner will pass. I'd bet a jum on dat. I hope so, I said. I do think we are not too far from Provincia and San Andreas. I looked hard at Timothy. Are they islands? He nodded. I kept looking at him. It seemed there was a film. A haze separating us. I rubbed my eyes and opened them again, but the haze was still there. I glanced over at the red ball of the sun, now clear of the horizon. It seemed dim. I said, I think there's something wrong with my eyes. Timothy said, I warn you, you looked direct at the sun yesterday. Yes, that was it. I looked at the sun too much. Today, Timothy said, do not even look at the water. The glare is bad too. He went back setting up the triangles for our shelter and I took off my clothes. After he had draped my pants and shirt, I got under the shelter. The pain in my head was almost unbearable now, and I remember moaning. Timothy tore off a piece of his shirt from the shelter roof, soaked it in the fresh water, and placed it over my eyes. There was worry in his voice as he talked. A while later, I took the cloth off my eyes and looked up. The inside of our shelter was shadowy and dark, but the pain had begun to go away. It doesn't hurt as much anymore, I said. I see. It just takes time, young boss. I put the cool cloth back over my eyes and went to sleep again. When I woke, it was night. Yet the air felt hot and the breeze that came across the raft was warm. I lay there thinking, what time is it? I asked, about 10 at night.